The immense vastness of our mysterious universe, with its billions of galaxies and countless stars, and the continuous sightings throughout time of strange lights in the skies, certainly begs the question, are we really alone in the infinite universe? The Bible records an almost unlimited number of angelic excursions to the earth. And if UFOs are not in some way related to this angelic traffic in the heavens, well then we are left in total darkness concerning the strange visitors to planet Earth. I've never forgotten my roots here in this town. It was here that I grew up. I can remember uh, coming to town maybe with a quarter. Uh, there was a theater around the uh, corner here. And I'd take a dime and go to the shoot 'em up hop along Cassidy. And uh, maybe go across the street over here and get a hamburger for a nickel and a 12 ounce uh, bottle of Pepsi Cola. And uh, you know, that was really living in those days. I can remember those early days coming to town on a bale of cotton. The gin was over here by the railroad track, waiting in long lines uh, to get the cotton gin. I can remember one afternoon in 1937, I was only about 14 years old then, and uh, I was coming home from school, and it was late, and uh, it was still light back in the west, but it was getting dark in the east. And uh, I just happened to glance, but all at once uh, there was a ball of light come from over the trees back in the east. And uh, this uh, ball of light came up kind of like an old Roman candle a fireworks ball and it just stopped it didn't slow down it just stopped and uh, I stopped and looked and I couldn't figure out what it was and I thought who would be shooting fireworks out here at this time and that doesn't look like fireworks exactly and as I looked about five seconds later another ball came up and lined up with it just for the side of it and then about five seconds uh, long after that, another ball came up and lined up beside the first two. At that time, uh, no one had uh, ever heard of UFOs as far as I know. At least I hadn't heard of them. There weren't even any helicopters in those days. And uh, I wasn't afraid or anything. I just didn't know what they were. So I sat down just in back of me here on the ground and uh, watched them. And I must have uh, sat there for 45 minutes or an hour. They never moved. They were uh, white and uh, had uh, kind of tinges of pink or blue at times. And finally I decided, well, uh, my grandmother probably has uh, supper ready. So I simply went in and ate. And uh, it took me probably about 15, 20 minutes. And then I came out and uh, looked up to see if they were still there, and they were gone. This is Cairo, Egypt. Noisy, congested, and deeply religious. Home to 22 million people and why there are thousands of mosques of all shapes and sizes within the borders of this great city. Under this religious veil, there stands history's most prolific wonder of the world, the Great Pyramid. The greatest architectural and engineering marvel of all time. Hello, I'm Ken Klein, your host. We've come halfway around the world to seek an answer to a most incredible question. A question even more wondrous than the pyramid itself. Were angels, also known as messengers, sent to this planet to design and engineer the Great Pyramid as a prophecy hidden 
in stone. Certainly the pyramids were made with mystical knowledge. Knowledge beyond the realm of this world, certainly of that day. If we go back before the flood, we know that Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. The word there that Enoch walked with God in the Hebrew is Elohim, meaning in the plural, angels. Enoch walked with angels. And according to Josephus and many other sages, Enoch could have been the builder of the Great Pyramid. Josephus said the pyramids contain knowledge of the heavens. It is quite possible that the knowledge was imparted to Enoch by the angel. And as Josephus indicates, this is where he got the knowledge to incorporate into the pyramid knowledge from the heavens. I think it's fair to say that for the most part, people in general have a dubious view of extraterrestrials or supernatural life. But over the past couple of decades, there have been many manifestations on this planet of just that, especially in the ancient world and also since the modern era began in the time of Christ. Manifestations that simply have no logical answer or explanation. These are petroglyphs painted by Indians in the American Southwest. According to Indian folklore, these two objects collided high in the sky near Death Valley. This is an artist's reproduction of a relief found in a labyrinth on the island of Jutuo. There were found in this cave various reliefs showing humans in strange clothes with halos around their heads. Cave paintings from Otolo depict several large disc-shaped objects. The second of these two from Kolo shows four entities surrounding a woman. Notice the entity looking down from inside some sort of box or object. These are images from a cave in France, a cave called Peck. These are very ancient drawings that depict a landscape full of wildlife together with saucer-shaped objects. The objects seem totally out of context. Another cave drawing of rock art from Toro Muerto, Peru also reaches back to the ancient past and shows us the beings have some sort of halo over their heads, like earlier pictures we have noted. In the right hand picture there is some sort of object left of the main being. This is a famous cave painting in Val Camonic, Italy of two beings looking like they are dressed in spacesuits. A petroglyph discovered in Puerto Mexico. You can see four figures with their arms outstretched below a large oval radiating globe. And these are illustrations that come from a cave in the northern part of Australia. These cave paintings are called Wangina by the Aborigines who painted them. Notice again the halos. Here we have two crusaders dated from the 12th century and refer to a very peculiar sighting of unidentified objects. The sighting took place during the siege of the Saxons at the French castle of Seaburg. During the fierce conflict, when the Saxons saw the flaming discs, they fled in fear. These images come from a 10th century Tibetan Sanskrit text. Here you can see two objects that look like hats, only they are flying. The witness described the objects as double-decked cylindrical aircraft with portholes in the dome, which flew at the speed of the wind. This is a fresco located in Kosovo, Yugoslavia, entitled The Crucifixion and was painted in the year 1350. Two objects can be seen on the right and the left of Christ. A closer look reveals faces inside the flying objects. These two renderings are pictures of tapestries in the 15th century located in the French Basilica of Notre Dame in Burgundy. They both depict the life of Mary. Hat-shaped objects can be seen in both tapestries. The next painting, the Annunciation, also with rich religious overtones, was painted somewhere between 1430 and 1495 and is located in the National Gallery in London. A disc-shaped object hovers above, overseeing the events at hand. 
Here is a very clear portrayal in a painting called the Madonna, created in the 15th century. We find above Mary's right shoulder a disc-shaped object, below a blow-up with a man and his dog looking up at the object. A 17th century fresco located in a cathedral in Mesqueda, Georgia, of the crucifixion and two saucer-shaped objects emitting light or flames under the right and left arms of Christ. In the blow-up, you can see faces looking down. This is an image by a Flemish artist, de Gilder, painted in 1710. It is called the Baptism of Christ. A disc-shaped object is shining beams of light down on John the Baptist. But apart from the artwork and the evidence left in caves that we've seen in the ancient world, there's even more remarkable evidence given in a very sequestered and hidden away place in the Old Testament. Before he died, King David of Israel gave this charge to his son Solomon concerning the implements to be placed inside the holy temple of the Jews. And for the altar of incense, refined gold by weight, and gold for the model of the chariot of the cherubims that spread out their wings and cover the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. First Chronicles 28, 18. Contrary to what most people think, that angels fly around with their wings flapping, this is a direct reference to angels flying in vessels or in ships. And David commissioned his son Solomon to make a copy of those ships that was to be placed in the venerated holy temple of the Jews. In the antiquities, legends and myths of Egypt, it was told that there was an ancient age, an age of the gods, also known as the time of Osiris, and this was before the dynastic period. In the ancient traditions of the pyramid, the Great Pyramid, when it was erected, it was to memorialize a great catastrophe in the planetary system that manifested fire and a great flood on the earth. Josephus, in his Antiquity of the Jews, writes, the descendants of Seth, after perfecting their study of astronomy, set out for Egypt and embodied their discoveries in the building of two monuments, in order that this knowledge might not be lost upon Adam's prediction that the world was to be destroyed by a flood. Now this monument remains in the land of Syria, which is Cairo to this day. The Arabs of old called it the Pillar of Enoch, and that it was built before the flood by a man named Troth, one of the venerated and celebrated mythological gods of Egypt today is this Troth, which is the Egyptian name for Enoch, the god of knowledge. One of the earliest legends about the Great Pyramid coming from Arab traditions is from a historian named Mohammed ben Balki, who stated that the pyramids of Giza were built as a refuge against an approaching destruction of either fire or water. It is very interesting indeed that most of the legends and traditions concerning the Great Pyramid agree that the Great Pyramid was built before the deluge that covered the earth and it was built as a repository to preserve knowledge and information. As we probe deeper and deeper into the true meaning of the pyramid, we will find that it has a profound significance and spiritual meaning to us all. While the Great Pyramid was already present during the time of Abraham, Moses, and even Jesus, it is only mentioned once in all of the Old Testament. The prophet Isaiah wrote, In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of Egypt, a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord, and it shall be a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts. The word for pillar is better rendered in the Hebrew language as monument of course being located in both the midst of Egypt and at the same time at the border seems a logical impossibility. However, in ancient time, before the unification of the country, there was a lower Egypt to the north and an upper Egypt to the south. The border between the two Egypts goes right through the Great Pyramid on the Giza Plateau, and Giza itself means border thus placing the pyramid at both the border and in the midst at the same time. 
On this basis, the pyramid qualifies as that pillar or monument written in the book of Isaiah 19. When you really stop to think about what the prophet Isaiah is saying here, his words confront and contradict the traditional Egyptian view of the Great Pyramid. The traditional view is that Khufu built the pyramid and that it was built as his tomb. I feel that sometimes archaeologists themselves forget that archaeology is an actual science. And science is not about expressing beliefs or opinions, but science is about expressing verifiable data. And if the verifiable data is later on shown to be different or wrong, then the scientists will revise their descriptions, their discussions, their explanations of something to express as best they can the new data. But what you see happening with orthodoxy a lot of times in Egyptology is there's a certain notion they have and they have built a whole bunch of different sort of constructs for it and they're hesitant to give up on some of the things that the alternative people would say because it would make them really rewrite a whole lot of their history and Egyptian history is very long so it's a big big undertaking so there's an understandable resistance but the problem is that it's perpetuating to the public some incorrect notions about Egyptology and the de development of civilization there so what I would like to see is the archaeologists sort of humbling themselves the conventional Orthodox Egyptologists humbling themselves and at least at least having intellectual courage to read the very well written by the way alternative books on archaeology as I have done. If you read both, alternative and orthodoxy, you're able to say something that actually explains the whole. But if you only know one side or the other, you're unbalanced. In current day, Egyptology theory is unbalanced. The truth is, the so-called historical tomb theory rests upon three very dubious historical facts. One, the testimony and views of Herodotus, who is called the father of history, to a wannabe archaeologist, and three, a very small statue of a very strange nature. There's a lot of different scientists that think Khufu did it, and they base this on a few different pieces of evidence. One in 445 BC, Herodotus, he came to Egypt this is over 2,000 years, even after the alleged time of the construction of the pyramids. Over 2,000 years, okay? That's a long time, 2,000 years. He's been there for a few weeks and he gets told a legend about the Great Pyramid. Herodotus, the great Greek historian who's known as the father of history, was fascinated with the Great Pyramid. He decided to make a trip to the Giza Plateau about the fourth century BC. Unfortunately, it was almost two to 3,000 years after the pyramids had been built. And so he didn't have much to go on when he got there except talk to some of the townspeople. And that's pretty much where he got his information. And from that point, he made his extrapolations and calculations. He determined and calculated that it took 30 years to build the Great Pyramid, 10 years to do all the preparation work like building the causeways and diverting the Nile River, which would have been quite a chore in that time, and an additional 20 years to bring all of those gigantic boulders, some weighing three tons or more, to the Giza Plateau to construct into the Great Pyramid. But as we will see, Herodotus's calculations just don't add up. The reign of Khufu was only 23 years, which already you can see and do the numbers, do not fit into the time span that Herodotus allowed for the building of the Great Pyramid. It would take the laying of one three-ton stone every four minutes, non-stop, 24-7, for 20 years. And remember, the river flooded during the rainy seasons in the southern portion of the Nile. That lasted three months, so actually, there were only nine months to work, and they didn't have lights at night, so your 24-hour day is reduced to 12. So you do the math. They would have had to lay a stone less than every two minutes for 20 years just to reach Herodotus's numbers. Herodotus's numbers simply do not work. They just don't add up. But Herodotus' 30-year estimation is complicated by other factors, the casing stones. In addition to the 2,300,000 inner core blocks, 
There were 144,000 casing stones that covered over these stair-stepped inner core blocks. As we peek around the corner of the Great Pyramid and we look at the Khafra Pyramid, the middle pyramid, we can still see some remaining casing blocks at the very top of that pyramid. But just as the Khafra Pyramid was covered with casing stones, so was the Great Pyramid. The casing stones were made from a very hard white limestone that was then highly polished. And when put in place, it created a very smooth surface, not like the stair-step look you see today created by the inner core blocks. When the sun struck the surface of the casing stones, the pyramids could be seen from very long distances. And at night, the light of the pyramid was used for navigating the Nile. The casing blocks were removed after a great earthquake in 1356 and were then used to build many of the old mosques around Cairo today. But there are still a few casing stones remaining that have been left around the base. The limestone, the covering stones, the casing stones, were mined up the Nile River some 15 kilometers from Giza at a place called Tura, Egypt. We've come south of Cairo about 15 kilometers and this is the enormous Tura limestone quarry. For thousands of years, limestone was taken out of this quarry for all kinds of building projects throughout Egypt. Today, they use huge cranes and modern machinery to do the work. In the days of the building of the pyramid, they used hand tools, at least we think they used hand tools. The fact of the matter is we don't even know what they used because Certainly there was no steel tools because steel would be yet two to three thousand years in the future and we have no records that they used iron tools. What we're told is that they used copper tools, but copper tools are much softer than this Tura limestone and they even used granite blocks mined from way up the river in uh, Aswan. And then if you ask the archaeologists, or go right over to the Cairo Museum, the bastion of Egyptology, Orthodox Egyptology, and you say, what carving tools did the Egyptians have? And they'll go, um, uh, uh, copper and bronze. And if you say, well, to the geologist, how hard is copper and bronze? And they'll go, well, 4.5 to 5.5, near that on the Mohs scale. Well, how hard is this granite? Oh, this granite's over 6. Could these tools cut this granite? Oh, no way. So how did it get cut? Nobody has the answer. The truth is, no one knows for certain how they excavated these limestone blocks from these pits. Not only do we not know how they excavated the limestone casing blocks, we haven't a clue how they dressed them. These massive 20-ton blocks of stone, which after being dressed to the most exact cuts and configurations, would weigh in at about 15 tons. They had to be perfectly cut on six sides with such precision that when each of the six sides was put in place with their neighboring stones, the space between the stones was a mere one-fiftieth of an inch. To duplicate that feat today would take diamond tip saw blades and computer precision cutting. And by the way, when they were finished, they put mortar in between the joints. Then the massive stones would have to be taken to the river, which was over a mile from the quarry, loaded on barges, and then taken 15 kilometers downriver, and then unloaded. How long would it have taken to load and then unload 15-ton blocks? And look at this river. This is no small river, and the current is very powerful. They didn't have diesel engines to strain against the river to cross it from one side to the other and the river became even more difficult to navigate during the rainy seasons when the Nile spilled over its banks. Look at this modern boat loaded with about 15 tons of people straining against the powerful current. And then, how did they get the barges back up 15 kilometers of river against the powerful current? And where did they get the wood for the barges? Egypt only had palm trees. They would have had to have dozens of barges, maybe hundreds, 
just to move the limestone quick enough to fit into Herodotus's 20-year time period that he calculated it took to build the Great Pyramid. If they were able to move just 50 limestone casing blocks a day for a year, don't forget the rainy season, which has a three-month period when the river was too swollen to use, they could have transported 13,750 casing stones a year. It would have taken at least 10 years just to move the outer casing blocks. But the calculations of Herodotus under careful scrutiny just don't add up. The second pillar of fact upon which the so-called tomb theory rests is the suspicious findings of Richard Howard Weiss, who entered into the pyramid through Al Mamun's doorway in 1820. Well, in the Great Pyramid, there's a chamber, incorrectly called the King's Chamber. Nobody ever buried in it, no sarcophagus, just a coffer, no human being, no funerary remains, not a tomb. In that, there's this ceiling like this over this big coffer. Well, over a period of a number of years, they dug above it. But these are massive pieces of granite, hard, hard, hard granite. So how do they get through them? Well, a little chip or a little screwdriver, isn't it? They use dynamite primitive dynamite and they it'd be like going into the great museum in Paris and there's the Mona Lisa and you know just spitting on it and spraying pay paint you wouldn't do that it's a great work of art well here's this thing the most significant architectural structure of human civilization ever on the planet right there and they're blowing it up with dynamite to get into this chamber above it and they get in the chamber and there's nothing there they understand finally that, oh, it's, it's built to relieve stress from this huge amount of weight on top of the pyramid pushing down. So it's, it's called a relieving chamber. So some years pass and then somebody else says, there's got to be another one. So they get the dynamite out again and they bang, 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 and they go up there again. And they do this through four different big pieces of stone getting to the fifth chamber. And finally in the fifth chamber, they find something that they didn't find in the lower chambers. That's very curious. There's quarry marks in them, but they find something that they didn't find somewhere else in its in an odd position and it's not really very well written and this guy Howard Weiss, Richard Howard Weiss, Howard Weiss, a British fellow who wasn't an archaeologist by the way, no, he wasn't even an antiquarian, he just had some interest in coming and he had a, a moderately wealthy family and they were happy to see him go because he was a bit problematic and so he went to Egypt on sort of the grand tour thing and then he became an archaeologist or an antiquarian and he somehow mm -hmm, got a little bit of sponsor, got a little bit of funding, and, but then he wasn't making any discoveries. One of the reasons because he didn't know what he was doing. But So he had to sort of, the, the skeptics say, he had to sort of manufacture an important find. So he thought, what's more important than the authorship of the Great Pyramid? So he, he or one of the workmen with him or something, maybe him, because he could have been the only one in there at this point. He was the first one in when it, they opened it up. He, Somebody, somebody put a mark that some people then later said looks like the hieroglyph of Khufu, though it's written at the wrong angle, and it's maybe not even Khufu, but Kuti, K-H-U-T-I, which means different things than Khufu. Only those three things. And it's made out of this red ochre, iron oxide. It can't be carbon dated. They don't know how old it is, but there's a number of things about it that just kind of indicate, no, it's not Khufu. And I feel that it's a, a forgery and it's not to be used as evidence of the age or the authorship or of the pyramid. The last pillar upon which this so-called tomb theory rests is a diminutive statue that I was able to locate at the Cairo Museum. When I first saw the statue, well, I laughed. I was expecting to see some large portrayal of the Pharaoh Khufu, builder of the greatest monument, the greatest building the world has ever known. But the statue I saw well, you got to see this for yourself. This statue of Khufu was found in a temple by Flanders Petrie in 1903. You can't really appreciate and get a sense of how ludicrous and ridiculous the idea is that this is one of the proofs that is offered suggesting that Pharaoh Khufu was the builder of the Great Pyramid until you see the size of this overwhelming proof. The statue in the Cairo Museum is about two at the most three inches tall, and yet because it is inscribed with information that it is a statue of Khufu is no proof at all that the Great Pyramid of Khufu was built by Khufu. 
And yet this overwhelming proof of a three inch statue is one of the three pillars that the Great Pyramid was a tomb built by and for the Pharaoh Khufu. But perhaps the most significant discovery that sheds the true light on the popular but false tomb theory is unfortunately suppressed. Between the feet of the Great Sphinx is what is called the Sphinx Stella. But another stella was discovered in a temple nearby the Great Pyramid that dates from 1500 BC called the Inventory Stella. After trying to find the Inventory Stella at the Cairo Museum, officials told me it was here, not far from the Sphinx. That object you see behind me with the rounded top, they say is the location of the Inventory Stella. But as you can see, it's encased in wood and metal, and if you wanted to look at it, well, you couldn't. And officials today are not willing to show it to anyone. And yet it remains the most significant piece of information that tells us that Khufu was not the builder of the Great Pyramid and that it wasn't built as his tomb. How do we know these facts? Because the information on the inventory, Stella, hasn't always been suppressed. As I said earlier, in the 19th century, particularly in the early and the middle parts of the 19th century, there were a lot of European-sponsored archaeological excavations and explorations in different parts of Egypt, upper and lower Egypt, as you might say. Well, in the course of those, in 1857, there was a Frenchman named Auguste Mariette, and he found one time, I don't know the whole story right now, he found what they have come to call, because of its listing of some things also, an inventory stella. Then what it said is what's very interesting. Now there's different interpretations of the, the hieroglyphic text on here, but basically if you boil it down, what it, it said is that Khufu came here or sponsored, he sponsored himself, a sort of um, cleaning up of two structures, the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx, which automatically proves that Khafra couldn't have built the Sphinx because Khufu was born before Khafra. But he cleaned up and he, um, you know, just were, had work done on the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid, and it says this in this stella, and then he, it says also in the stella that he dedicated the pyramid, called it the Tomb of Isis. I mean the temple, not the tomb, the Temple of Isis. He didn't go inside, he couldn't go inside. The Temple of Isis. What does that mean? About the only pyramid or pyramids that Khufu actually did build on the Giza Plateau that are talked about in the inventory stella is if you know, as you know, there's three major pyramids and then there's three others here and they were her relatives of Khufu and that's what he built and that's what is recorded along with other things in the inventory stella. What you're seeing over here to the right is as we take a look over here to these pyramids, these small pyramids, these are the pyramids that were built by Khufu in memory of his family. And they're really the only pyramids that Khufu built. They say that Khufu built the Great Pyramid, but on the inventory stella, we have proof that uh, he only built these smaller ones that you see over here behind the Menkerios Pyramid. So the stella is another reason that I think we can say that Khufu had nothing to do with the building of the pyramid. He even admitted himself that he refurbished it in the Sphinx a little bit, and we found that in 1857. Obviously, the missing inventory stella, if it could be located and studied today, would shed enormous light on the truth of Khufu's involvement with the Great Pyramid. One of the most romantic stories that occurred during the lifespan of the Great Pyramid happened in 820, when an Arab sheik named Al Mamun came to the Giza Plateau looking for riches that were reportedly hidden inside. For days, he and his men searched the steep polished surface limestone covering seeking for the secret entrance, but they couldn't find it. Not to be thwarted, Al Mamun and his men battered their way through the rock, but became weary of the great chore. About to give up, they heard a rock fall from the inside. Tremendously encouraged, they continued smashing through. They found a descending passageway. Overhead, they saw an ascending passageway plugged by a huge granite stone. Already wearied, they took the path of least resistance, continuing down the descending passageway several hundred feet below.
They hit bottom where they had come to the bottomless pit. Retracing their steps, they returned back to the point of the blocked ascending passageway and dug around the granite plug through the softer limestone until they came around to the other side of it. Continuing upward, they came to the fabulous Grand Gallery. Momentarily, they were stunned by the incredible architecture. But these were driven men, impatient and lusting for treasure. At the end of the Grand Gallery, there's a small room called the Antechamber. The light shines underneath where Al Mamoon and his men broke through three slabs of red granite, each slab 12 inches thick and 7 foot tall. Once on the other side of the Antechamber, they entered the Upper or King's Chamber, their torch lights flickering on the red granite walls. Above them rested 80 ton granite blocks that came from 500 miles up the Nile that formed the ceiling. The joints so finely cut that today, they are almost without duplication. At the end of the 25-foot room, the torchlight faintly lit on a 5-foot red granite box. With great excitement and anticipation, they lifted the lid. The box was empty. No riches, no mummy, no nothing. Distracted by their bitter disappointment, had they searched the room more carefully, they would have noticed two ventilation shafts that were pointing to the heavens. But no one would notice that for another 12 centuries. But Al Mamun and his men uncovered something of far more importance than anyone would ever imagine. It was in the antechamber. The builders had dropped into place three slabs of red granite to block and seal the way from the Grand Gallery into the upper or King's Chamber. Now, that place had been sealed from the beginning of the building. Nobody had yet entered into the King's Chamber. When Mamun broke through those huge slabs of granite and he entered into the King's Chamber, he found nothing. There was no riches, there was no anything. In fact, there was not even a mummy in the funerary box that you find there in the King's Chamber. The three so-called porticullis slabs that sealed the way had been dropped into place from above into slots created by flanges that were sculpted from the red granite rock and extended outward from the walls. The slabs were lowered by ropes through these grooves that were carved into the walls. The way into the king's chamber was now perfectly sealed. The slabs could only have been set in place at the time the builders had reached that very level. That meant that Al Mamun and his men were the very first to reach the upper or king's chamber since the time it had been sealed off. And so since the pyramid had been sealed for thousands of years and nobody had broken through, Mamun inadvertently proved that the Great Pyramid was not built as a tomb. Either the builders had made a terrible mistake and had forgotten to place the Pharaoh's mummy in the totally sealed up pyramid or they had never intended to put the mummy in the pyramid in the first place. But of all the facts that have been presented to this point, there really is one more vital piece of information, and it really is a glaring issue. But if you weren't paying close attention, you would miss it because it's only conspicuous by its absence. And it's an issue that the Egyptian orthodoxy does not want to talk about. We're traveling south from Cairo, on a road that goes towards first Abu Sir and then to Saqqara. Abu Sir is the location of the fifth dynasty pyramids and Saqqara the location of the third dynasty pyramids. As we travel farther and farther away from Cairo you get the feeling you are going backward in time. The Egypt of today is like an overlayment on a land that is still caught up with living in its past. As you can see, apart from the cars, it's not hard to imagine you are back in time thousands of years. Egypt was and still is a land of ancient traditions, monuments, temples, 
And of course, it's the land of the pyramids. But if you say, well, you know, I, I've been around Egypt a lot and I looked at a whole lot of books on Egyptology and man, they like to make sculptures and paintings. It's covered everything. Every inch of their temples is just covered with murals of painting and stuff depicting huh, what? Oh, what Egyptians are doing. And what is Egyptians doing but whatever the royalty told them to do. And they're building stuff. Why is it we don't have one single, one single depiction, one single depiction from all of Egypt of them building a pyramid. <laughs> Whatever mode of transportation necessary to take in the study of Egypt, you quickly learned that the Egyptians took great pride and made enormous efforts to document and leave extensive records of their daily lives and religious devotion. However, there is one great omission, a chronological interruption and an enormous divide between the fifth and the third dynasty periods. An omission that goes virtually unnoticed and needs to be fully investigated and understood. We've come 25 kilometers south of Cairo to a place called Abbasir. I'm standing next to a farm and over my shoulder you can see what remains of one of the last pyramids of the 5th dynasty. The fifth dynasty of Egypt lasted from 2464 to 2323 BC and is considered part of the old kingdom of ancient Egypt. During this dynasty, Egyptian religion made several important changes. The cult of the god Ra emerged and kings built temples dedicated to Ra at Abusir. The fifth dynasty also marks the first emergence of the pyramid texts. Pictures on the inside walls of tombs tell the lives of the kings and their families. These hieroglyphics were also placed on the inside walls as a safeguard for the king's journey into the afterlife. The hieroglyphic writings were known as the pyramid texts. The pyramid's deteriorated condition prevents us from going inside, but adjacent and connected to the pyramid which was built by the same pharaoh king we make a notable but not surprising find. Consistent throughout all of Egypt, on obelisks, pillars, and in temples, and almost anywhere you look, we find wall paintings and hieroglyphics, and it's no different here in this temple, next to the ruined and fallen pyramid in Abbasir. These historical references clearly demonstrate that the pharaohs of the 5th dynasty period wanted to leave copious records of their culture, religion, and veneration to their gods. Off in the distance, as though we are looking back into time, there we can see the step pyramid of the 3rd dynasty reported to be the oldest pyramid in all of Egypt. This temple serves as an entryway into the Step Pyramid Complex and is considered by the Egyptians to be the oldest temple in the world. The Step Pyramid was created at Saqqara in 2750 BC for King Zosar of the Third Dynasty of Ancient Egypt. The Step Pyramid looks something like a wedding cake with six different layers piled on top of one another. The pyramid is considered to be the oldest stone building in the world. And it was this pyramid that initiated the whole episode of pyramid building in Egypt which began here in the third dynasty. The common theory is that the pyramid building began here and evolved to higher degrees of proficiency as each successive pharaoh became more and more advanced in knowledge than his predecessor. We're going beneath to see what the lower chamber has to show us. Down below, we find again the evidence that Egyptians who built these pyramids not only recorded their daily lives, but also were careful to give honor to their many gods.
throughout the entire land of Egypt, in the 5th and now as we have just seen in the 3rd dynasty, and from around Egypt in general, the land was covered from the earliest times with hieroglyphics, religious images, and wall pictures of Egyptian culture. Everywhere. Everywhere you look, it's the same. Except on the Giza Plateau. Neither in nor on any of the three pyramids of Giza do we find any hieroglyphics or wall paintings referencing Egyptian culture. Nor is there honor bestowed on the pharaoh who built them. Why did the builders of Giza neglect this most common practice? And what about the theory that the pyramids evolved from primitive states ascending to the higher states of sophistication as we see in the Great Pyramid of Giza? Look again at the level of sophistication in the Third Dynasty pyramids, which lasted only 50 years. The quality, the quality of the craftsmanship that went into building the Great Pyramid is, I like to say to people, people like a sort of contemporary hook they can get something into conceptually. I go, you ever heard of that guy, Bill Gates? They go, yeah, sure. I go, Bill Gates, with all his money and with all his mathematical knowledge and all those people working for him, they couldn't build the Great Pyramid. Is it possible that in a mere 50 years, the pharaohs of the third dynasty were able to pass on to those that would follow them enough knowledge of physics, architecture, geology, mathematics, and astronomy to construct inner chambers with passageways, ventilation ducts, and the ability to cut and move up to 80 tons of red granite and hoist them into place? Then, when the fourth dynasty was over, to see this high state of pyramid development, de-evolve in the 5th dynasty pyramids and go back to the 3rd dynasty technology? Look at these 5th dynasty pyramids. They've been reduced to piles of rubble, even though they are much younger in age than the 4th dynasty pyramids of Giza. Not only do we see a Passover of no hieroglyphics in the 4th dynasty pyramids, but there is some kind of quantum leap in technology from the 3rd to the 4th and a return back to a primitive technology state in the 5th that Egyptian history cannot explain. There can only be one answer. Even though the Great Pyramid is in the land of Egypt, it was not built by the Egyptians. It was built before the pharaohs, during the time of the gods, before the great deluge that flooded the earth. One of the most remarkable evidences of a pre-diluvian presence of the Great Pyramid was discovered when salt encrustations of more than an inch in depth was discovered in the lower portion of the Grand Gallery and the Middle Chamber. We have this, level, this water mark all around a certain height on the pyramid. Okay, here's the pyramid, sides of the pyramid, this water mark. That's sort of the same level of the salt encrustations inside the pyramid. And they both have a type of salt that indicates there was seawater there. Just again, it's not salt coming out of the limestone. And it can, can, can confirm that there was some big, large amount of water here for a long time, not just a, a flood during a storm, but the waters rose. All around the base of the pyramid and all around the base of other pyramids, there was a level of debris, a level of rocks and things up to like 14 feet deep in certain places that had so many seashells in it seashells in it, and even the remains, the bony remains of a sea cow. How, how did it get there? <laughs> they were brought there by large amounts of water. Corroborating this evidence of a pre-diluvian existence of the Giza pyramids were reports of water rings around on the casing stones at the very level of the Grand Gallery and mid-chamber where the salt was originally found. One of the more obvious known facts of Egyptian history is that the pharaohs of old had enormous ego. Look at these statues giving honor to themselves. Not to be outdone, here is an entire sanctuary built to the honor of the only woman who was pharaoh. Here, a depiction of Ramesses II and his wife the obvious relationship of the size of Pharaoh to the diminutive size of his wife is a telltale reflection of the Pharaoh's sense of self-importance and the insignificance of his wife. This characteristic is also evident in the very nature of the Temple of Karnak in Luxor, which took 1,000 years to build. Why did it take so long? 
because each successive pharaoh king was trying to outdo his predecessor as he continued adding his own more spectacular touch to the evolving and growing temple. But this Egyptian tradition and egotistical pharaonic characteristic do not fit with the Giza pyramids. The Giza pyramids actually decline in size and grandeur. The Great Pyramid was of course the first and most elaborate. The second, or middle pyramid, the Khafra Pyramid, was smaller than the Great Pyramid and finally the Menkerios, the last and smallest of the three. When we consider this contradiction, along with the most recent findings of Robert Bouval, we come to some amazing insights. Bouval discovered that not only do the ventilation ducts in the King's Chamber points to the stars, but the whole Giza pyramid complex actually mirrors in perfect alignment the stars in the belt of Orion. This one breakthrough alone forces us to rethink our presuppositions of the pyramid as a great tomb of Khufu. What we are seeing here in the motivation of the builders is absolutely no reference to Egyptian culture nor any traditional offering of thanks of worship to the gods of Egypt totally uncharacteristic of the pharaohs, but rather a Herculean effort to attract attention to a complex of structures that point humanity to the stars. The Giza pyramids together transcribe from the heavens a star map built with such incredible sophistication and science that it would endure the whole of human time in the midst of the 20th century, aerial photos opened the door for startling revelations. Not only did the builders have to be master architects in dealing with the complicated problems created by the complexity of the interior design with its many chambers and ascending and descending passageways, but the builders of the Great Pyramid had to be the greatest land surveyors the world has ever known. The builders did not have maps or large ships to travel the seas to gain the objectivity to know exactly where to build a pyramid, which made finding the proper location impossible. Nevertheless, look at what the ancients who built the pyramids would have to have known. In this illustration, it can be seen that by drawing lines through the north-south axis and the east-west axis around the globe, they can be seen as the longest lines that cover the terrestrial Earth. This means that the Great Pyramid lies in the center of gravity of the continents and in the center of all the land area of the world. At the same time, the Great Pyramid is positioned at the center of the Nile Delta Quadrant. And while they were at it, the builders built with such precision that the Great Pyramid is orientated to the northeast-southwest quadrant. And what is completely astounding is that this alignment was done without compass which was not invented until 1500 years after Christ. The Great Pyramid also became Egypt's sundial not only for days and hours but for the seasons of the year. The reflections and shadows precisely define the solar astronomical year. The people of that day did not have the objectivity to know these things. It had to be handed down from a supernatural source. The builders also had to be the greatest geologist because they had to pick a location that could withstand the enormous weight for all time. Coincidentally, the builders found solid granite rock on the Giza Plateau and then set out to make it level. There could be only one place in all the world where the confluence of these factors could present themselves. The Giza Plateau met the precise location for the monument as prophesied by Isaiah in the midst of Egypt and at its borders. How level is the foundation? The foundation is so exactly level that on the 13 acres upon which the pyramid rests, it does not vary more than one half an inch. This foundation supports five million 300,000 tons of rock with such precision and genius that in over 5,000 years it has not settled even a fraction of an inch. This is a feat that in all the world cannot be matched today. While the foundation was near perfectly leveled, 
the builders were yet very concerned about the shifting tendency of the Earth's surface due to the frequency of earthquakes in the region. Consequently, they made allowances for this shifting by cutting ball and socket joints into the granite bedrock at each corner. Their keen foresight in engineering this feature into the design has kept the pyramid square and level for thousands of years. Scientific facts that had been kept hidden for 5,000 years came into the light of day when this aerial photo was inadvertently taken. Look at the shadow the sun casts on the Great Pyramid. It's only half a shadow. Now look at the shadow on the Khafra Pyramid. A full shadow is cast across the face of the pyramid. Here's another view where seams can be seen running down the sides from top to bottom. On further investigation, it was discovered that the Great Pyramid was actually curved at its base. Scientists have deduced that the builders wanted to control the enormous weight and maintain the integrity of the pyramid over the long haul of human time, engineered into the Great Pyramid the principle of the arch. The idea is much like the way a dam is used to hold back the tremendous weight of water. But it was also learned that this curvature built into the base of the pyramid was at exactly the same ratio as the circumference of the earth. Further proving that the builders of the Great Pyramid had the knowledge that the earth was round. On further investigation of the casing stones, the very slope of the pyramid was discovered to be at 52 degrees. A pyramid with an angle of elevation of 52 degrees has the unique properties that its height stands in the same ratio to its circumference as the radius to the circumference of a circle. In other words, if the height of the pyramid is taken as the radius of a circle, the distance around the base of the pyramid is exactly equal to the circumference of that circle. That is to say, the circumference of any size circle is always 3.14 times its diameter. The builders knew the difficult task of how to square a circle because they possessed the universal understanding of the geometric ratio of pi, a mathematical equation virtually unknown to man for thousands of years. But there's one more facet concerning the base of the pyramid. The base of each side of the pyramid is 365.2 Egyptian cubits. The number 365 is a commonly understood number because it's the number of days in a year. But what is not common knowledge is that the ancient character Enoch actually lived 365 years and he was taken. It's as if the name of Enoch, represented by the number of years he lived, was designed into the pyramid. A dilemma that perplexed scientists for thousands of years but was not discovered until the 20th century was the actual distance between the Earth and the Sun but the builders of the Great Pyramid knew the answer over 5,000 years ago. The four corners of the pyramid to its apex slopes inward 10 feet for every 9 feet of elevation. This suggests an equation. Multiplying the height of the pyramid by 10 9 times and reduced to miles gives the astonishing result of 91,856,000 miles, the distance to the sun. When satellite technology became available in the 20th century, the Earth's surface was mapped and the mean altitude of the Earth's land surface became known. Remarkably, it coincides and is the same as the height of the Great Pyramid. In 2139 BC, the descending passageway which descended to the bottomless pit was also lined up perfectly with the North Star of that day, which was the star Alpha Draconius. The descending passageway that leads down to the pyramid's bottomless pit is set at a 26 degree angle. If the same angle of 26 degrees were imposed and drawn from the northern base of the Great Pyramid, extending outward the line passes right through the little town of Bethlehem where the Messiah was born. In addition, it is exactly 2139 furlongs from the base of the Great Pyramid to Bethlehem the number of furlongs matching the very year when Alpha Draconius was sighted in the turret of the descending passageway. So not only does a directional line pass through Bethlehem, but a timeline that intersects with it in Bethlehem as well. There are many more prophecies contained in the vaults, chambers, and passageways of the Great Pyramid. 
But before delving any deeper into the mystery of the prophecies, we must first consider the most important prophecy of all, and it's where the builders left off. For on top of the Great Pyramid, there is no capstone. In all of architecture, the only masonry that answers to the idea of a capstone is the chief cornerstone of a pyramid, where all the sides of a pyramid reach their conclusion, and yet, on the Great Pyramid, it is missing. Is it the stone that the builders rejected? But it seems no doubt that the Apostle Paul had the capstone of the pyramid in mind when he said it was the chief cornerstone that the builders rejected, an obvious metaphoric association with the Messiah. When you look at all the facts and evidence, it's hard to deny that the planet Earth suspended in the vastness of this great universe was visited not by malevolent aliens, but by divine messengers called Elohim, or angels. Divine messengers and representatives of the Most High God who traveled the starways, who came to leave us a prophecy in a monument we call the Great Pyramid. Isaiah the prophet writes again, Have not I called you that I might plant the heavens? Is it possible that the life and work of Enoch, memorialized in the Great Pyramid, is a sign, a precursor to those that would follow afterwards? A prophecy hidden in stone. How was Enoch taken up into heaven? Probably in a fiery chariot. Maybe like one of those that I saw here in 1937.